you like as we as we get started here. Um, you know, what other opportunities do you see for uh, like bringing NLP to bear on parts of ML where it's not used quite so much? I think the potential of like language is that, you know, humans or language has evolved for human communication and learning, right? And as a result, it's ruthlessly efficient for communicating only the things that humans find relevant in the world, right? So mm -hmm. for example, we have this issue where you know, we have vision models or we have natural language inference or, you know, processing models that uh, latch on to spurious correlations, right? They care more about textures. Uh, they're vulnerable to these adversarial examples. And to me, that's like all signs that what the model is learning does not align with human intuitions about what we should learn, right? And so then the question is like, can language actually be used as kind of uh, a framework for encouraging a model to learn the right abstractions, right? Mm -hmm. So to learn the relevant features of some input, right? So we teach a model that like a dog is a dog because it has ears and it has four legs and whatnot, right? And not because like the texture is a certain pattern or like, you know, there's a certain RGB pixel value that, you know, is indicative. Um, and so being able to learn those kinds of the right kind of features uh, and decomposing those features um, through language, I think is, is super interesting. Yeah, I, I like that as sort of like a, a, a language prior. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, well, so I'll go ahead and start us off here. So welcome to the Weights and Biases Deep Learning Salon. I am your regular host, Charles Fry. I've got with me uh, Jesse Mew today. And I wanted to do a quick couple of announcements before we get started. First is our announcing our speakers for the uh, salon at the end of the month. So in two weeks, We'll have two speakers, Richard Crabe, who is the founder and CEO of Numeri, which um, is uh, the world's biggest, and in his words, will soon be the world's last hedge fund. It's a collaborative approach to, uh, to solving the problem of, of, of pricing and investment with data science run by anonymous, essentially, data scientists uh, collaborating and competing in order to win um, to win cryptocurrency prizes. So they've got some new features they're rolling out and he'll be on to talk about those and uh, about the problem of non-stationary time series, which is really cool. Uh, well, in addition, we'll have another co-founder, Alexa Milosevic, uh, who is the co-founder of an NLP startup called Jarvis Management that's essentially applying NLP to the problems that basically JIRA solves now. Uh, and he'll be talking, I think we'll get a little bit about Jarvis, but I think the main thing he plans to talk about is about making NLP applications work well and work fast. Um, so I'm really excited to hear, uh, hear about that. Uh, it's, you know, we've got a, a lot of folks, I think, in the audience who are interested in, in, in applications and ML ops in, you know, getting good performance in, in actual uh, in actual applications built with ML. So I'm excited to hear about that from Alexa. Uh, just a reminder, we push, we push these salons up on YouTube. So if you head to our YouTube channel, Weights Biases, you can catch all the YouTube, or the, sorry, the deep learning salons you've missed and a bunch of other things, including our podcast, Gradient Descent, hosted by our CEO, Lucas Bewald, along with a couple, uh, a bunch of other things, app tutorials and more. The podcast is really great. We've had um, we had Jeremy Howard recently. Uh, we've had folks. Uh, the most recent one was with uh, the um, uh, a fairness lead at Facebook AI Research. Lots of really great uh, stuff in there. We also have, as always, our Slack forum uh, at bitoli slash Slack forum, where you can uh, uh, where you can participate in a bunch of AMAs with some uh, some other really great people in the. Uh, in the ML community, we had the CEO of Kaggle, Anthony Goldblum, on, the author of Ludwig, uh, which is Uber AI's auto ML uh, solution. Uh, and uh, so just come by our Slack forum, where it's, it's pretty active. We've got hundreds of people posting every single day. Uh, so you should, uh, you, you'll find lots of interesting stuff there. All right, announcements out of the way. I'm going to toss it over to our speaker for the day, uh, Jesse Mu, who's a grad student. Uh, at Stanford in the Stanford NLP group and uh, wrote this really elegant paper on generating explanations for neurons that, uh, and so I'm really excited to hear him talk about that. So uh, Jesse, go ahead. Great, thanks for having me. Uh, really excited to be here. Let me share my screen.
Cool. Yeah. So uh, really happy to be here. Uh, I'm talking about work um, that I've been doing with Jacob Andreas, who is uh, in the language and intelligence group at MIT. And I personally am a third year CS PhD student uh, at Stanford working with um, Stanford NLP and uh, Noah Goodman. So uh, the way that we're going to um, begin this talk is by looking at kind of our favorite deep model, right, which we're going to call M. It's some sort of black box and we don't really know how it works. And the way M uh, processes uh, information is by taking some sort of input X and then producing some sort of output Y. So the kinds of tasks that we care about in machine learning are, for example, image processing tasks like scene classification or natural language processing tasks like natural language inference. Um, the challenge you know, in machine learning is really identifying what exactly is going on in this model and how does it actually learn to solve the task at hand? Right. So if we take a closer look, we find that most deep models take some high dimensional input X and then transform it into some lower dimensional space, which we'll call theta. Uh, and the goal of model interpretability is given this representation theta, what kind of information does a representation encode? And does that information closely align with human intuitions about the kind of information that model should encode? So one of the most popular kind of approaches to analyzing the information inside learned deep representations is what I'm going to call representation level analyses or probing, uh, which started, you know, very recently, I think. And the basic idea is we take some model which learns representations. He, let's say, imagine here it's for some sort of machine translation task. And then we train a slightly uh, smaller supervised model called a probe that goes from the representation and tries to predict some sort of property of the input. In this case, let's imagine it's trying to predict the part of speech of the word dog. And if this probe ends up getting high accuracy on this task, then we can then claim that the representation theta encodes information about the part of speech because the probe is able to use those features to predict the property of interest. So this has been, I think, enormously influential for model interpretability, but there's one primary issue with this kind of work, uh, which is that there's been a recent debate uh, in the interpretability literature about whether the success of a probe means that uh, the information is encoded in the representation, or rather that we just have a very powerful probe that has memorized the task. And so this has been kind of a back and forth debate. So instead, I want to advocate for an alternative way of analyzing representations. And this is by analyzing the individual features or neurons of deep representations. And so analyzing individual neurons, of course, has some advantages in that we can't detect uh, concepts that are distributed across multiple neurons, but it has several advantages, right? First, analyzing neurons allows us to measure the extent to which representations are disentangled or decomposed into individual concepts that lie along individual features. Also, because we've greatly reduced the complexity of the behavior we're looking at, we don't do any sort of transformation. We don't do any sort of supervised learning. We're only inspecting kind of surface level behavior of a neuron, and we avoid those past debates about how complex probing methods should be. So analyzing individual neurons has also seen a lot of interest in the interpretability literature recently. Um, part of it started from this great work uh, by David Bao, also at MIT, called Net Dissect. Uh, and we're going to describe this method in detail because we build off of this basic idea. And it's also been applied in NLP as well. But I think one of the fundamental limitations of the existing work on interpretability so far uh, is the following. So imagine we're trying to explain the, a neuron in some sort of vision network for seeing classification. And the way we might do so, and the way Netisic proposes to do this, is by looking at the images that most maximally activate the neuron. So in this case, we have four images, and the neuron is active in those highlighted regions. And if we take a look at these four images, it becomes obvious to us that it seems like this neuron is detecting bull rings. And this is the explanation that Netisic assigns this neuron. However, uh, if we begin to look at the other images for which this neuron activates, we see a very different story, right? So now it's clear that this neuron is not just firing for uh, bull rings, but rather for a bunch of different kinds of sports fields, baseball fields, and whatnot. And in so reality, you know, to, un to understand what this neuron is doing, we really need a much richer explanation of what's going on in this neuron. And the focus of this talk is how to generate such an explanation. In general, we're taking this, you know, a philosophy that uh, neurons, especially later in the network, are not just simple feature detectors, but rather can be considered as implementing complex decision rules, or you can even think of them as programs composed of multiple concepts. So how do we generate these? So I'll first describe the basic technique of Netisect and then propose uh, an extension to that to handle compositional concepts. The idea is that we have some data set of inputs, which we'll call X. 
and some sort of model that transformed these inputs into representations. We can inspect individual neurons of the representation. Here it's unit 483 in ResNet uh, and examine the activations of this neuron over the inputs. And the challenge is to try to identify or explain this neuron's behavior in human understandable terms. So the way that Netisic proposes to do this is by first segmenting the neurons into binary masks. So we determine some threshold, let's say, you know, the top 1% of values this neuron takes. And whenever this neuron exceeds that threshold, we consider the neuron active at that point. Now to generate an explanation, we need some sort of uh, gold hand annotated inventory of concepts, which are also represented as segmentation masks, such as water or river or even colors. Then the challenge is to find the explanation that most closely matches the behavior of the neuron. And the way we do so is by some sort of measure of goodness of an explanation. And for that, we'll use the intersection over union score or IOU. This is commonly used in say bounding box prediction in computer vision. If we measure IOU, we find that the best explanation we have out of this simple concept inventory is the water concept. And this is the explanation uh, that Netisect obtains. But of course, we take a closer look, it's clear that like this is not the entire story, right? Uh, it seems like the behavior is a little bit more sophisticated than just detecting all bodies of water because it does not activate for that middle image. So our contribution is to combinatorially expand the possible concepts under consideration with compositional operators on concepts, right? So consider the logical operations and, or, and not, and then we can use these logical operations to combine existing concepts to form progressively more complex ones. And we'll iteratively construct these more complex operations, uh, sorry, concepts uh, via beam search. So at one step of beam search, we might compose, for example, and construct a, a water or river uh, concept, which just is the logical or of the two masks, or we might invert the blue mask to get non-blue colors. Finally, we keep going and let's imagine that we stop at this explanation. So this is kind of a length three logical explanation, uh, which has a much higher IOU compared to the water uh, neuron and is more closely descriptive of the behavior of this neuron, right? And in particular, the explanation we have assigned now is that this neuron fires for water that's not blue. So that's the basic technique. Um, I think there are a number of questions we can begin to explore with this technique, but here are three that we looked at in the paper. The first is, uh, do neurons learn compositional concepts? So uh, does, this you know, does this explanation technique bias anything over just simple metasect? The second is whether the interpretability of individual concepts in a model relate to downstream task performance in any way. And the third is whether we can use our explanations to begin to probe or manipulate model behavior. So let's look at these three questions. The first is, do neurons learn compositional concepts? So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot on the x-axis the maximum formula length of the explanations we generate with our procedure, and on the y-axis, the average explanation quality, or IOU, of each neuron. So at formula length one, we have metasect, and as we increase the formula length, we get progressively complex, uh, more complex explanations. So what we see here is a positive relationship between formula length and IOU, indicating that we are indeed generating higher quality explanations as measured by IOU with about a 68% increase in explanation quality when we go from say one to length 10. We can take a look at qualitatively what kind of concepts are identified in this model. This is the model ResNet train on a steam classification task. And we see that a lot of interesting abstractions emerge, right? So I can categorize these kind of broadly into four categories. The first of which are meaningful perceptual abstractions uh, that we can take a look here. Unit 192 fires for towers. Unit 310 fires for, say, bathroom appliances. And we're going to call these abstractions both perceptually meaningful and lexically meaningful because we can take a look at the explanation and understand the kinds of uh, concepts that are being fired for. We also have maybe about 22% of neurons which fall into this category of learning an abstraction that is perceptually meaningful but does not exist uh, in our concept inventory. And so unit 321, for example, is clearly some sort of ball or sphere detector, uh, but we do not have annotations of balls or spheres in our library and therefore the explanation we have ball pit or orchard or bounce game it's a little bit less clear how that relates to the activations 
We also see examples of specialization. So this is where neurons activate for more specific versions of concepts that are in our inventory. This includes that famous non-blue water neuron and also an attic neuron that fires only for the top triangular part and not the floor. And finally, we see examples of what I'm gonna call polysemanticity, which is the tendency for neurons to fire for completely separate concepts. And so that includes neurons that fires for say, operating rooms or castles or bathrooms or bakeries or shop fronts and et cetera. So this has given us an explanation kind of of what we're seeing in the behavior of a neural network that's been trained for seeding classification. Now let's take a look at whether or not the concepts here relate to model performance in any way. So the way we're gonna do this is by obtaining some sort of measure of the reliability or accuracy of the neuron. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna measure the model accuracy on inputs when the neuron is maximally active, right? So when the neuron lights up, when it contributes to a decision, how accurate is the model decision on average? Here I'm plotting on the x-axis, the average explanation quality of our neuron, and on the y-axis, the accuracy of the neuron when it fires. And what we see is a positive relationship, which is noisy, but highly significant. And importantly, this correlation increases as we increase the quality of our explanations. And so what this is saying that as, is that at least in the computer vision case, neurons that are more human interpretable, that uh, are more compositional in their concepts, uh, end up being more reliable uh, for test time performance. And finally, here's um, kind of one last question, which I think is the most interesting one, which is can our explanations give us insight into how we can control and manipulate model behavior? So we've probed the final convolutional layer before the prediction of ResNet, which allows us to look at what kind of explanations contribute to certain class predictions. So here's an example of class 324 or swimming hole. Uh, and we take a look at the kinds of concepts that feed into this class. A lot of them are sensible. We have foliage and we have waters and we have creeks and deserts. Um, but in particular, there's a return of that non-blue water neuron. This non-blue water neuron is interesting, right? What, what happens is if we take a swimming hole image, which a bunch of neural networks think is swimming hole, and we paint the water blue, we manipulate the model prediction uh, to grotto in three out of the four networks that we explored, including networks that are outside of the probe one, which is ResNet 18. So this indicates that you know, we're latching onto some sort of data set bias here that swimming holes always have non-blue water and these explanations have given us uh, insight into how we can then manipulate this behavior. Another example here is clean room. Um, so it's a little bit less clear uh, what kind of concepts are feeding into this prediction. But in particular, there's one concept here that fires for igloos. Uh, and so if we take a corridor and put uh, an igloo in it, we change the prediction from corridor to clean room uh, but only here in the probed ResNet 18. And finally, one more example, here's a viaduct. Uh, the you know, concepts that feed into this prediction are quite sensible, but there's one neuron that fires for washers and laundromats as well. So we take a forest path, we stick a bunch of washing machines there, and we change the prediction to viaduct. So the method that I described here is in general, it's task agnostic. We don't have to apply it to vision. We can apply it to any kind of representation uh, learned by some deep model. And just as proof of concept, we can explore a natural language processing task. So this is the task of natural language inference. The basic idea is that we're given two sentences. One is a premise sentence, uh, such as a woman in a light blue jacket is riding a bike. And then there's a hypothesis a sentence, like a woman in a jacket is riding a bike. And the objective is to determine the relationship between the truth conditions of the two sentences. So in this case, the premise entails the hypothesis. But if we change it to a bus, for example, then it's a contradiction. And finally, there might be a neutral prediction. There's no relation between the premise and the hypothesis. So I'm picking this task as a representative NLP task because in recent years, this task has come under scrutiny uh, because it's unclear how much actual inference is happening in natural language inference. So I'm gonna surround inference with quotes here. And here are two hints as to why this might be happening. Right? The first is we take some model that encodes the premise and the hypothesis and produces some prediction. Some sort of standard neural model gets us around 78% accuracy. Right? So that's pretty good. However, if we design an ablated version of the model, which only takes the hypothesis as input, so it completely ignores the premise, this model still gets 69% accuracy. Right? So there's a drop in accuracy, but this is actually still really good. And importantly, it's far above chance. So this is uh, an indicator that there's not actually much inference happening in this model. Similarly, we can come up with certain heuristics, uh, so heuristic rules such as predict entailment when all of the words in the hypothesis are also in the premise, as is the case here. 
Turns out if you apply these heuristics, when they do apply, you get 90% accuracy on examples where this heuristic applies. And there are several such heuristics like this. So this indicates to, to us that you know, these models are maybe not really learning the right thing in trying to solve these tasks and are instead latching on to certain spurious correlations or data set biases. And we wanted to look at whether or not we can uncover these behaviors with our explainability technique. So here's our NLP model, our NLI model, and we're gonna probe the final layer of the kind of multi-layer perceptron. So we encode the premise and the hypothesis with LSTMs, we combine them and then try to produce some prediction. And we're gonna probe the final layer before the prediction. Our concepts will be very, very simple bag of words concepts. So given some sort of premise hypothesis pair, we extract these very simple concepts where pre colon woman indicates that the word woman appears in the premise. Uh, pre colon NN indicates the word, uh, sorry, the noun appears in a sentence, premise, anywhere in the premise, uh, and so on. And additionally, there's this kind of overlap feature which indicates the degree to which the premise and the hypothesis share words. So in this case, uh, they share 75% of unique words. And finally, as our compositions, we can use and, or, and not, but just as a hint that we can use more unique compositions, I'll also define the neighbor's composition, uh, which the neighbors of a certain token is the logical or across the five most similar words to this token in uh, glove embedding space. And so the idea here is we're capturing this intuition that a neuron might fire for semantically similar words. Let's now answer our three questions. First, do neurons learn compositional concepts? Here is a model trained on the Stanford Natural Language Inference dataset. And we again see this positive relationship between our formula length and explanation quality. Uh, qualitatively, let's take a look at what's going on. So here is unit 870 in this model. Uh, here's the explanation we assign along with its IOU. And here are some examples of the neuron being most active. So uh, in general, uh, if we take a look here, we would really label this neuron as being gender sensitive. So it activates when the premise contains the word man and does not contain the word woman and the hypothesis does not contain the word man. So basically whenever there is a gender switch between the premise and the hypothesis, this neuron votes in favor of contradiction. So we can analyze the weights of this neuron towards the three class predictions here. Here's another neuron that fires. Uh, there's a few you know, noisy explanations here, but the key here is that overlap of 75% neuron. Uh, this neuron fires when the premise and the hypothesis share many, many common words and it votes towards entailment. So these are the kinds of lexical overlap heuristics I was talking about earlier. Finally, here's a neuron that um, uh, activates whenever the word sitting is in the hypothesis. So these are words where the verb is actually quite indicative of the class prediction, even though they really shouldn't be. And so this one activates whenever the word uh, sitting is in the hypothesis, but not the premise. And lastly, we have neurons that are not well explained by a feature set, right? So this one activates whenever uh, there is a noun in the premise, which is almost all the time. We can again relate interpretability to model performance. Uh, and here we actually see a negative relationship. So what this is saying is that the better we are able to describe our neurons with our explanation technique, the less accurate the neuron is. And the reason why is because the kinds of features we're using are very, very simple, right? They're just these really simple bag of words features, which you would not expect to really be involved in any sort of robust natural language inference. And so the better we can describe neurons as you know, using these very, very simple decision rules, the less accurate they are on average. And interestingly, the uh, simpler our explanations, the better we capture this anti-correlation. So one kind of key caveat here is that interpretability is not a priori correlated with performance. It really depends on the space of concepts that we're searching for. So in the vision case, we really were searching for meaningful abstractions, whereas in this case, we're trying to identify undesirable behaviors. And finally, let's take a look at how we can now manipulate model behavior in the same way. So here's an explanation of a neuron. This one fires whenever the word nobody is in the hypothesis. So that is a very clear signal that there's a contradiction, at least in this data set. So we take a premise hypothesis pair, such as three women prepare a meal in the kitchen, uh, and we can modify the hypothesis to nobody but the ladies are cooking. And so this should change the true label from entailment to neutral, but it changes the true prediction, sorry, the model prediction from entailment to contradiction. So we've induced uh, adversarial behavior in this model. Here's another example. Uh, this neuron fires for whenever there's some sort of word related to a couch or a table or a seat in the hypothesis. 
Uh, and so we take this premise and hypothesis pair and we add the word couch in the hypothesis. We change the true prediction from entailment to neutral, but the model prediction from entailment to contradiction. Finally, one more, here's that sitting neuron. Uh, here we can modify the premise instead. So we have a blonde woman is holding two golf balls or reaching down into a golf ball. And the hypothesis is a blonde woman is sitting down. It turns out if we just cut out most of the premise and we just have a blonde woman is holding two golf balls, um, the model still votes for contradiction, even though the true label is now neutral, right? So it's just the presence of sitting there that's determining the model prediction in this case. So just to summarize, uh, I've described a method for model interpretability and neuron interpretability specifically uh, that generates compositional explanations of the individual neurons inside deep representations, uh, which allow us to identify interesting, more rich behavior in neurons. So this includes meaningful abstractions in vision, polysemanticity, and spurious correlations in language. These concepts actually have something to do with the downstream task performance of a model, right? So we can actually use these explanations to disambiguate neurons that are better or worse with respect to performance. And finally, we've shown some early evidence that we can now predictably manipulate the kind of behaviors of neurons by analyzing the explanations and then staging interventions based on the explanations. So future questions I'd like to explore. One is, can we better look at connections between layers? So here we always probe the final layer of a neural network, but we can definitely look at intermediate layers. And if you're interested in this kind of work, uh, the circuits work from the OpenAI team with Chris Ola has done really great work in this kind of fee area. And finally, insofar as we've identified that more interpretable concepts are maybe more desirable when it comes to performance, can we begin to use interpretability as a sort of training signal? We can try to encourage a model to be interpretable from the start. And does this lead to better performance? So that's it. I wanted to thank my collaborators and Jacob Andreas. Uh, here are some links to code and the preprint. And I'm happy to take questions at this point. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Jesse, for um, really interesting uh, interesting work and, and well presented also. Um, so my, uh, I encourage folks on the Zoom to put their questions in the Q&A uh, and folks on YouTube can put them in the live chat. Uh, but to kick us off, I guess, so my actually, my one of my questions you already, you already covered in your future direction. So I wanted to probe a little bit deeper on that, uh, which is, so what do you think the prospects are for using something like this as a form of regularization? It seems like an, like, you, since you have these sort of two sides where it's like, okay, if the comp if the explanations are bad heuristics, uh, that um, if, they're, if they're bad heuristics, that's maybe something that you want to penalize. If they are rich compositional explanations, maybe that's something that you want to uh, encourage. Yeah, so I think it really depends, as you said, in the explanation we're generating and whether or not they're correlated with desirable or undesirable behaviors. Um, in terms of, you know, in the desirable case, like in the vision case, for example, we might encourage the development of neurons to recognize uh, well-defined atomic concepts like dogs and cats. That seems like something that we can definitely do. Uh, but then the question becomes, you know, at what level do we really need to encourage this interpretability, right? So do we need to encourage it at the level of individual neurons, as we've done before? Or can we maybe encourage it, uh, you know, basically just it needs to encode the concept somewhere, right? It doesn't have to be individual neurons. I think the individual neuron thing is interesting. I definitely think that there are ways that we can adapt this metric into something that's explicitly optimizable so that we can actually use it as some, as some sort of auxiliary regularization technique. And maybe the benefit we get there is like very, very clean interpretability, right? Like we know there is a cat and dog neuron in this model because we've trained the model to expose that feature. Um, whether or not it matters for performance at all compared to maybe more general regularization techniques, I have no clue, but it's an interesting avenue for sure. Yeah, I think that would be, would be cool. It seems, yeah, the challenge that I immediately see is coming up with a way to quantify it so that you can include it easily in backprop, right? Yeah, so the basic idea I think is to introduce some sort of continuous version of this discrete, discrete thing, right? So instead of having to segment, uh, we could imagine just doing kind of a soft matching between the activations of a neuron and these ground truth concepts. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would allow us to backprop through it. Uh, the other challenge then is just figuring out um, but, you know, when neurons don't learn concepts at all, how do we know or how do we, you know, which concepts are we pointing our neurons to in the first place, right? Mm. Uh, and generating these explanations takes time, and that's right. somewhat unclear. Definitely. Um, so one thing, uh, I guess I, I kind of want to ask, what makes, what do you think makes individual neurons, like, more explainable versus 
less explainable. So I, I mean, things like architecture choices, regularization choices, data augmentation, or its absence. Do you have any sense for that? Yeah, uh, it's a really tricky question. You know, I think a lot of it is going to be driven by by data. Uh, I think a neuron is predisposed to do the easiest possible thing, which is just to latch on to something non-interpretable or spurious, uh, as long as the data doesn't really sufficiently test like the capabilities of that neuron in a way, right? So we can use these cheats to kind of get away with, with uh, uh, simple, simple cheats. Um, that, for example, is an explanation of why there might be polysemanticity in neurons, that a neuron can serve double duty as a bakery and a shop front, for example, because it never has to really clean, cleanly distinguish between bakeries and shop fronts, right? Mm -hmm. so if we had a more robust data set where you really had to differentiate between the two, uh, the neuron might be forced to be more interpretable, or the entire model in general might be forced to be more interpretable and better kind of organize its representation space into meaningful ways. Mm. And is there a clean way to distinguish between apparent like polysemanticity of an individual neuron and just representations being say like holographic or dense in the layer of all the neurons? Uh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I would say not entirely. So, I mean, this work, you know, really looked at individual neurons. And so we really can't, determine the degree to which, for example, a neuron is polysemantic for bakeries and shop runs, right? But maybe it's just like one component of a much larger distributed bakery detector. Um, I think the most promising work that tries to, to identify that is by looking at like, what kind of neurons activate for individual predictions, right? So mm -hmm. given a single bakery image, take a look at the neurons that are firing, maybe it turns out that there are multiple bakery detectors. And so we can actually identify the specific, you know, subspace that lights up for bakery, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, that's definitely an avenue of future work, which I think is definitely worth pursuing. Yeah, one of the it seems like one of the challenges there is that like one of the problems you solved elegantly in this paper is like okay, if we combine a bunch of simple things in a principled fashion, then we can we get access to a large space of possible explanations. Uh, but then when you try to understand polysemanticity, you also have another like exponential explosion problem, which is that all the possible polysemantic combination or not all the possible combinations of neurons that could be representing a concept is way bigger than just the set of all possible, the set of all neurons in the layer. Yeah. Yeah, that's the challenge. Um, and there's not a clear trade-off between the two. I mean, this is why people are advocating for kind of the supervised methods, right? Uh, and maybe we need to look towards that literature to really, you know, identify concepts that basically in any way, shape or form are somehow encoded in representations. Um, but of course, that already has its own debates. Although I think we're getting to steps where we're beginning to understand the kind of information that's encoded. Um, but certainly, you can definitely make, say, slightly simpler assumptions about the way concepts are encoded, and then begin to look at, for example, multi-neuron concepts, right? So maybe it's not dramatically too difficult to imagine that individual neurons fire up a certain concept, and then consider a limited subset of linear combinations of those neurons, and identify mm -hmm. to what extent those fire for concepts. Uh, that might not increase the search space too much. That, uh, yeah, that does make sense. Um, what role do you think that like optimization based explanations of neurons have to play? Uh, so like, you know, basically like lucid where, or deep dream where it's like, okay, take an image or take a baseline and increase the activation of this neuron, this linear subspace of neurons. Do you think that's something that could help with other kinds of explanation? Is it orthogonal? Is it maybe misleading? What do you think? No, I think all that work is really, really excellent. I think the main thing is that there's a lot of really interesting kind of model visualization or interpretability techniques that require that a practitioner implements this algorithm or runs it and then it inspects the activation patterns right and so you do some deep dream thing you say oh this is the neuron that this is firing for right but the problem is that you have to go in there and actually look at the neuron and say oh this is firing for dogs and cats right there's no automatic gen explanation that's generated uh, and so what results is that you know it can be potentially very time consuming so the kind of approach that we're describing here is more of like an automated analysis where it's like, let's automatically identify the behaviors that are encoded and maybe try to surface the interesting ones. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that like in some ways are complementary, right? Like you do automated analysis of the type, type described here. Uh, and then maybe if you need deeper dives or even prettier visualizations, you can inspect individual neurons by themselves. Hmm. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, that makes sense. It does seem, yeah, that, uh, uh... Chris Ola said something at a talk I saw once of just like he'd spent like thousands of hours with just 
um, the uh, the one that they did for circuits. I forget whether it was Inception V1, I think is what it was. Anyway, he spent thousands of hours with just this neural network, like looking through all of its neurons. He knows them by name. You know, he's got friends and enemies right. like in the units of, of Inception. And uh, that's, you know, useful and we've learned a lot, but it's not scalable the way an automated approach like yours is. Yeah, I think as a result, like that work has generated just much richer understanding of the way that certain constants are composed together in your in neural networks to form, you know, more sophisticated object detectors. Um, but you're right, it's not scalable, right? So the goal, I think, is like to bring this kind of automatic generation closer to the kinds of insights that this kind of hand curated circuits work can bring us. Mm. That's cool. That's a great. That's a great ambition, and I look forward to seeing the rest of your work. That's. Uh... Uh, all the time we have for the first speaker slot. So I'll uh, thank you for thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing. Uh, I look forward to see the the rest of your work in the future. Yeah, no, really happy. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, uh, today is a very uh, a very special instance of the uh, deep uh, the weights and biases deep learning salon, uh, which is I'm going to give a talk. Uh, so. Uh, in case you were not yet tired of hearing my voice, uh, the talk I'm going to give uh, has the provocative title, Neural Networks Are for Typecasting. Uh, so the TLDR here is that the, you know, the embeddings of a neural network obtained by training on a difficult task are often more useful than the outputs. And the main contribution here is that I want to like to think about these em embeddings actually as types that they're sort of analogous to like 32-bit floats or 8-bit integers. And the only difference is that they are learned rather than designed. Uh, and so the, the, the goal here is basically to present an intuition for embeddings in neural networks that are um, that's maybe closer to the intuition that people who have a programming and CS background bring rather than sort of like a math and physics background, which is where the idea of embeddings comes from. Uh, or, you know, if you're not one for nuance, uh, you know, if you if I wanted to put this talk out there on the internet to get get clout and caught and put out my hot takes, uh, the purpose of neural networks is just glorified typecasting. So to be so to be clear, when I say types, like a type is just a collection of data values with a name. So, you know, integers, this is a collection of of bit strings that have a particular name, uh, dictionaries, phone numbers, these are this, the same thing. And that name basically just describes how those values are to be interpreted. Maybe it, it, it suggests, okay, that what, what do you do with a phone number? Well, maybe you pull off the area code um, or maybe you, um, you know, send it to a phone app. Uh, whereas an integer, even though it might have the same underlying bit representation, you would do something very different with it. Uh, and it's important to note that though types are completely unnecessary for computation, you can do anything that you could do with types without them. They're extremely useful for thinking about computation. Uh, and so when we want to like organize our thoughts around our computation, when we want to, uh, when we want to communicate the, like what's important, what's not important in our, in our programs, uh, or when we want to obtain like a mathematical understanding of what, uh, what is and is not possible with different kinds of computing, Adding types is very useful, even down at the level of, of models of computation, like the typed lambda calculus, as opposed to the just baseline lambda calculus, these, these very low level models of what computation is. So it's a really useful idea and abstraction. And the, one of the points of this talk is to bring some of these ideas about types into uh, neural networks. So the, the fundamental purpose of types is to give meaning to binary values. So this binary string that I've got there, 11001001, et cetera, could be interpreted as two different things. It could be interpreted as a bitmap, in which case you get the image in the bottom left corner of the slide, or it could be interpreted as a real number, a binary sequence that corresponds to a particular real number. And in that case, it would be interpreted as pi. This is the binary expansion of pi. And once we have types, we can convert in between types. So maybe at one point, I need to say communicate the, this number pi through a QR code type mechanism. And then this image representation of pi would be really useful. Uh, or maybe I want to compress it, try compressing it, and I want to use, say, a, you know, an image compression algorithm to do it. So being able to convert it to a different type gives me access to a whole bunch of different algorithms, uh, algorithms that are not available for working with just you know, binary sequences that are real numbers. 
And new types can just in general make your life easier. So for floats, multiplying is easy, but adding is hard because fundamentally floats are like a logarithmic representation of numbers. Uh, whereas for binary numbers, just binary sequences to represent our numbers, multiplying becomes kind of hard, but adding is really, really easy. easy. Adding just basically becomes the XOR operation. It's like not even just a single line of Python, it's like a single CPU instruction, which is amazingly simple. Uh, so, and so just switching to a different type can sometimes take a problem that was really difficult and turn it into a problem that is really easy. So for example, if you're manipulating a directory by its name, if that name is a string, then there are lots of problems that can be kind of difficult to solve unless you convert it to a path first. So the path object available in Python's path lib is like a, a representation. Of, it's basically you put in a string and you get out a structured representation in which you can easily make the manipulations that you need to make with directories. It's much harder to treat it the way you would normally treat a string. Like it's harder to say, make it all uppercase, but you don't need to do that with a path. You need to do things like get rid of the directory or append a file extension, something like that. So I'm going to work through an example of this to make sort of really clear just how important it can be to think in terms of, of different types. And so the example is going to be based off of a failed Python enhancement proposal, PEP 313, which was an April Fool's suggestion to add Roman numeral literals to Python. Uh, so, you know, unfortunately, this, this PEP was rejected and not added to Python. Uh, and so there are no Roman numeral literals in Python. So if we want Roman numerals, we're going to need to roll our own. Uh, so what we want to be able to do, at least, you know, to just get started with this Roman numerals type, is we would want to take the built-in uh, integer type in Python, which can handle Arabic uh, numerals, so the numerals that... Uh, folks who write their numbers in English are very familiar with. Uh, and we want to take those kinds of integers and turn them into Roman numerals. Now, a fun fact about Roman numerals is actually they stop at 3,999. The Romans did not need to count things as big as we need to count uh, in the year um, uh, MMXX, the year 2020. Uh, but so, so we only need to focus on these, on these numbers, but even just in this smaller set of numbers that the Roman numerals properly cover. Uh, there's actually some interesting stuff going on. So it starts off looking like a tally system. One is a single I, two is two I's, three is three I's, but then four comes out of nowhere with an IV. Uh, and then five is a V after that, six is a VI. Then, you know, these, these, more complicated patterns start to arise. And by the point, by the time we get to 3,999, the mapping between the number in Arabic and the Roman numeral representation is not so simple. So we go from those, uh, those four numbers, 399, to MMCMXCIX. Uh, and so just looking at this problem as a single step, in a, as a type conversion from Arabic to, uh, to Roman numerals, this looks pretty challenging. But there's this actually great blog post by Sandy Metz, who is a Ruby programmer, uh, who described an insight that actually there, there used to be several kinds of Roman numerals. And one of them is what she calls additive Roman numerals. Uh, and so converting uh, the additive Roman numerals are actually really, really simple. So the Roman numeral for four in, or the additive Roman numeral for four is just I, 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 it's four I's. And then the additive Roman numeral for nine is V, I, 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 I. Uh, and so it's much simpler than the to convert from Arabic to these additive Roman numerals than to convert from Arabic to the Roman numerals, uh, the like the the ones everybody knows about, which she calls subtractive Roman numerals because they've got this special thing where sometimes you subtract one of the values. Uh, I from V gives you four in uh, in normal Roman numerals. Uh, and so these it's really easy actually to to trans to translate from additive Roman numerals to Roman numerals. It's, you know, it's, it's very straightforward to just replace those specific patterns with this subtraction. Uh, and so her insight was actually, you know, converting from Arabic to Roman is one idea. Uh, but uh, that should actually be sort of split up into two pieces. Arabic is much closer to additive Roman numerals than it is to Roman numerals. So let's do that step first, rather than sort of conflating these ideas into two steps. So I actually had read this blog post a while ago, like tracked it back down for the purposes of this talk uh, and decided to implement it myself. And in the end, it turned out to be actually just as easy as advertised. I needed to you know, do a little bit of chin scratching, but in the end, I got this really, really simple 
uh, you know, 20 something lines of Python to convert uh, Roman numerals from, uh, from their uh, integer representations. Uh, and just as she said, it was so much easier once I thought of it as a multi-step process with multiple types in it, not just Arabic numerals and Roman numerals, but also this new additive Roman numeral type. And I even added a, an additional type in there, a semi-additive string to make it even simpler and turn it into basically just uh, like some, like, like three steps, essentially. Uh, first to this additive uh, type, then to a semi-additive type, then finally to this sub subtractive Roman numeral type using only the sort of like very most basic of Python operations. So new types can just make your life a lot easier. We already saw that add Roman is, uh, the additive Roman is like much easier to translate into the full Roman numerals, but it's also true that addition and multiplication are actually kind of easier in additive Roman. Uh, so like to, to implement addition on Roman numerals, which you actually probably want to do is convert them to this additive Roman format, then implement addition there, and then maybe transmit it back to, uh, to Roman numerals. So these, the addition of this type gives us not only does it make our initial problem easier, but it actually makes a whole bunch of other things we might want to do with Roman numerals easier because we've got this nice, nice representation, this alternate representation in a different type. And so what this means is like, you know, this additive Roman type becomes kind of like a hub if we want to switch between things. So if we want to switch over to like a Babylonian number system, which is sexagesimal, meaning it is base 60, it's where our time system comes from. If we want to switch over to that, additive Roman, easier to switch over to Babylonian than from Roman. Similarly, if we wanted to switch over to pure tally marks, it's extremely trivial to switch over to tally marks from additive Roman, but much harder in regular uh, Roman. So if we make something that can convert between these types, then we actually give ourselves essentially like an exponential uh, increase in the number of things that we can do just by doing type conversions. The issue with this is that new types are actually kind of hard to find. So we were able to make this additive Roman type. And actually, uh, I think in uh, Sandy's description, she found it in the Wikipedia page describing the different versions of Roman numerals are there that, that are around there. But the types that we can make are actually pretty limited, as always when we're doing traditional computing with programming in, in Python rather than machine learning. Uh, by our capacity to reason. We have to reason our way to a type. We have to say, okay, here's the way this binary representation is used. Let's turn it into a different binary representation and use it in this different, uh, in a different way. Uh, and we have to think through that explicitly. And wouldn't it be great if we could actually just sort of like discover the types that we need, right? If we could automate the process of finding the types that we need for our computer programs, that would be really, really great. And the problem, I guess, for traditional machine learning is that linear models cannot discover new types. So if I do a linear prediction on data, so let's, let's imagine a classic example of predicting whether something is a picture of a cat or a dog. If I do a linear prediction on that data, I really, all that happens is the data comes in, I do, uh, I do one operation on it. And actually at that, after that linear operation, I'm basically done. People include a softmax, that's you know not really strictly necessary to get out your prediction. Really, once you've done the linear model, uh, or sorry, once you've done that linear transformation of taking the weights uh, and dot producting them with the data, you're basically just uh, you're done. Um, that's it. So there is no there's none of that ability to sort of like say, oh, what if this data were a different type? Maybe my prediction problem would be easier. Whereas neural networks can actually discover new types. And so if I build if I think about what my neural network is doing. It's applying a couple of different transformations in sequence. Uh, right here, I've basically only done one, but one could do it for like a much deeper, uh, a, a much deeper network. And then at the very end, once I've gotten that, uh, once I've gotten that, um, once I'm just before I'm ready to make my prediction, I actually apply that linear predict function, right? I take some weights, I multiply them by the activations of the previous layer, and then I pass it through a softmax and that gives me my prediction. So the final layer actually, uh, the, the top of the neural network is this linear prediction step. Uh, and so you could think of it as actually what's going on is that every other part of the neural network is doing a type conversion from data to the type data, which here is you know images, to the type embedding or embeddings of images. And those embeddings are going to be some complicated, uh, you know, high dimensional representation. They're hard to, to understand what's going on in an embedding. But what the, the property that they have is that it's really easy to use them to do the downstream prediction tasks, sort of by design. 
Uh, so this is typically called an embedding, right? So this, this view that what we're doing is, is creating a, a new type. Uh, the result of that type is typically called an embedding. And the intuition there is that our data sitting in, the, in its natural form, in its natural like binary format, or in its natural matrix format, is in this like tangled up state uh, where maybe like pictures of some foxes and dogs are very close to pictures of some cats because they share colors. Uh, and then other pictures of things that are very much like dogs are very far away from dogs. Uh, and then, and so it can be very difficult to, with a simple model, split out uh, our dogs from our cats or solve in general our task. And so what happens instead is that in the, in the course of that neural network's application of transformations to data, it produces an alternative coordinate space, an alternative representation of the data, such that all the dogs are on, say, the left-hand side, and all the all the cats are on the right-hand side, and things that are kind of ambiguous right there, which we're not sure whether this, you know, pangolin is a dog or a cat. That's not one of our possible our possible responses is not pangolin, and so it sort of ends up right here in the middle. And so this this intuition that it's embedding comes from like the world of topology, comes from physics, the idea of like taking a collection of points and then putting them in a different shape in a different space. Uh, so it's an intuition that doesn't bring ideas from computer science so much as it does bring ideas from applied math. So the, the I think, um, one of the consequences of this perspective is that we should think of neural networks as being cut kind of differently. The traditional way of representing a neural network, and this is from a uh, Condé Nast slash tech article, uh, is to think of them as an input layer, then hidden layers, then an output layer. And that emphasizes these, this like split between things that are visible and things that are invisible, sort of things that are on the interior and things that are on the exterior. But this is, I think, not the right way to split them up. The way we should sort of split them up is actually, so four parts. Uh, so rather than tripartite, a tetrapartite uh, partition of our neural networks, where we have data and predictions on the ends there, that's, we can still keep those. But then we split basically between our, that final linearly separable embedding, that, that embedding that is really useful for a linear model. And then we split that off from basically everything else, which is the sort of internal representations of this model, which need not necessarily be a useful embedding for any you know, linear model. Uh, so we should focus on that embedding part there. And actually, this connects to some ways of thinking about neural networks that are popular in the sort of traditional stats community. Uh, so this is, this is two tweets from Daniela Witten, uh, who was at one point the uh, MC of this Women in Statistics and Data Science uh, Twitter account, which every week features a different uh, woman in data science. Uh, and so during her week, she uh, made sure to uh, basically kind of troll the internet as much as possible. And one thing she did was point out how many things are just linear models, uh, where you're trying to guess something uh, and uh, we, you're, you're trying to make a model that, uh, that guesses an output and uh, she'll say whether it's a lin just a linear model or not. And her answer for deep learning was kind of interesting. She said, as a function of the nonlinear activa activations, it's just a linear model. Uh, that is like once you only think about that last layer there, uh, the basically everything we think about neural networks is is pulled from linear models. Whether you know things like SGD and regularization, uh, like we we draw those ideas from the world of linear modeling. And what we what we've changed is just the representation that goes into the linear model. We've changed the type of data that the linear model operates on, and that's actually a much smaller change than you would think. Uh, for uh, for how you know impressive the behavior and performance of neural networks are, I think it sort of suggests how useful a, a good linear model can be once it's fed good data. Uh, though the one important difference I want to point out is that the intermediate layers of a neural network are also type casting functions. So it's almost as though if we wanted to convert from a float 32 to say a float 16, so from single precision floats to half precision floats. On our way to doing that, we also spun off, oh, this is what it would look like as a 24-bit float. And this isn't the way our normal sort of type casting functions behave, right? Normally, we would just go straight from float 32 to float 16. Uh, but neural networks are not like that. Neural networks actually produce effectively a series of embeddings that get progressively more useful to a linear model. 
Uh, so the way that I actually like to think about it is that a neural network is a composable type caster. It's self-composed of composable type casters. So each chunk of your neural network as you slice off each layer is a different casting to a different type. Uh, and you can compose these together to get a casting into the, into the destination type, this linearly separable data at the end. Uh, so I think it's important to take a moment to explicitly state why I think this perspective is useful. I think the biggest thing is that it makes it more clear how to compose neural networks, right? So one of the advantages of neural networks, if you hear people talk about like, okay, why are neural networks so good? And why did the people who worked on neural networks back in the like late 90s to early 2000s, when they weren't that impressive in terms of their practical performance, why did they think neural networks were what it was? You know, why did they think that this was the important technology? And the answer, like, almost all of them give is that neural networks are composable. I can take little modules and combine them together. But if you look at the way we write neural networks, we often write them such that the output is this final prediction, right? It, it, the output of the network is, you know, just dog or like a, uh, a one hot vector that is the dog or like the soft max of the logits, uh, whatever, you know, whatever it is. Um, and that's actually not something you'd want to put into another neural network, right? You wouldn't actually really want to take that output, that softmax output directly and put it into another neural network, right? That's basically just a distribution over your, um, over your classes. And that's not always the really useful thing. The thing that's actually much more useful and actually makes a good input to a downstream neural network is that layer before the, the linear transformation, the softmax, that embedding, or even just like concatenate together several layers and turn that into say like a multi-channel image uh, that represents uh, the input to the neural network. That is a really good in input to a downstream neural network. So this, is, this allows us to compose, to combine in a chain multiple neural networks. It also encourages you to de-emphasize supervised learning, right? If the goal of training a neural network is to get this embedding here at the end, rather than directly to solve the task, then the task is actually less important. The important part of what the task I think really brings us is that it tries to encourage a rich, useful embedding representation. Uh, so it, it encourages you to instead think about uh, unsupervised learning, or as I have it here, fun supervised learning, uh, which is in addition to probably generating better embeddings is also less expensive, right? If I wanna, if I wanna label, every, if I wanna do supervised learning on every image posted on the internet, not only do I need to download every image posted on the internet, I need to get humans to label every single image posted on the internet. And humans have written a bunch of stuff around uh, images on the internet, but they haven't done it in a way that's quite useful enough to be, um, or that's quite the right format to be useful for supervised learning. But if I do something like an auto encoder, uh, so an unsupervised learning task on images where the goal is to take an image in and return it at the end, then that um, I don't actually need those labels anymore. And so I remove actually what's the most expensive and difficult step in my supervised learning pipeline. Uh, so by focusing on generating good embeddings, uh, you focus, you actually, I think, uh, recognize that there are better ways to get the downstream final thing that you need, right? When it comes time to do the downstream supervised task, you could take those embeddings that you learned in an easier, cheaper, more scalable, unsupervised manner, and then fine tune them to get that final um, supervised, uh, uh, that final supervised task solved. And in that case, you're just training a linear model and all the tools and ideas from linear models and statistics come in handy. Uh, this, this perspective also pushes you towards this model amalgamation style. So this is a, a sort of graph of, uh, of a fake machine learning pipeline that takes in raw data and then generates three different things. A prediction of, let's say this is a social network, uh, who might be friends with a user. So this is raw data about a user, maybe what they've been clicking on, uh, like the, their email and information about them. Uh, and it produces first a user embedding, and then a prediction of who they are friends with, and also a recommendation of maybe other people they could be friends with or other content on this social media network that they might like to see. It also predicts what they're going to click next. Maybe that might be helpful for your content delivery network to come up with smarter things to cache, 
but all of them pass through rather than going straight from raw user data to click prediction or straight from raw data to friend prediction. They pass through this central node here of the user embedding. And this, so this is behaving kind of like that additive Roman type that we had before, right? It's a, it's a useful intermediate type on which the operations we really want to do are easier. And so all of these arrows here are actually DNNs. But the difference is that sort of the most important DNN in the entire pipeline is this first one here that generates from the raw data a user embedding. And that, uh, that neural network is the most important one. And that's the one you know, uh, that's best understood as just a type casting network. And in fact, all of these click, this click prediction recommendation and friend prediction, these could even just be linear models on the user embedding if it's good enough. And actually, uh, this is not just a, a sort of toy example. Uh, or at least it's not just for Tor examples. Uh, so I've talked with folks at Google and folks at Twitter, and this is actually what they do. They may have like 150 models in production, uh, but actually the, uh, the, the core of it is an embedding model that then gets a, a model that produces these embeddings that gets fed to everything else. Uh, it also raises some important questions for the future of ML power technology. Uh, so just like three kind of research almost questions or, or broad scale questions that come up out of this. Uh, the first is sort of, you know, how can we document our types? Uh, an IEEE of NN learn types would, would actually be really great. Uh, so IEEE is the ones who put out that floating point standard and they define, you know, how you're supposed to behave on a bunch of, um, like if you implement floating point, like, what does that mean? You know, like, how does that constrict the behavior of your type? An IEEE standard for, say, embeddings of images, embeddings of, of natural languages, all, like, there's lots of data types out there that get used all the time in machine learning. And having a centralized standard would both level the ML playing field and make it easier to develop ML applications without having Google scale resources. And it would actually centralize some of the really hard work that's out there, like removing bias extremely difficult uh, it, to do uh, on your own. The, the techniques are very sort of like experimental um, and there's not a clear choice. There's not a, a cookbook, uh, but if we had a centralized re uh, repository for doing this, then we could come to a consensus on what an unbiased embedding of an image is. And that would be extremely useful. Also things like compression to get high performance. This is non-trivial. Uh, putting this all in one place, we could end up with a neural network that does that first embedding step and does it in a millisecond instead of a second. Uh, and so I think that, you know, adopting an approach in which we have defined types that are, you know, NN embedding image, you know, available in the Python standard library could be really useful for machine learning. Also, on a, on a more research level, there are a bunch of ideas in algebraic data types. So like once you have types, you can actually, there's like a mathematics of working with types. So there are some types, products types, exponential types. There's also been some exotic ideas in I think the last 10 years or so of calculus on data types to generate things like uh, lists uh, arise from applying Taylor expansion to, to expressions with, in the algebra of data types. And I think that there might be some low-hanging fruit out there uh, for ways that we can combine the results of neural networks in a smart way or extend them. Uh, and then lastly, now that we if, we, if we really think that what's going on here is that the neural networks are learning a smart embedding, maybe neural networks aren't the right choice. It hurts me to say this as a big fan of neural networks and somebody who's kind of all in on them. Uh, but maybe there's actually better ways to learn types, right? The fundamental goal here in machine learning is to learn programs, is to learn computer programs that take inputs and produce the appropriate outputs. And if we actually take a, you know, sort of more typed approach to this, and we realize that what we're really trying to do most of the time is learning types that make our programs trivial to impl implement, that really changes what we think are the most important sort of research directions to pursue. Uh, so there's a nice little blog post there uh, that, that indicates what those, that calculus of data types, where that arises uh, from. Uh, so that's, this is just a sort of perspective. I've come from like sort of combining together a couple of different ideas that are out there in the world of, of ML that you may have come across and trying to take this idea that the embeddings of a neural network uh, are actually more useful than the outputs and trying to give it a bit of a more computer science flavor uh, and to think of these embeddings actually as, as types. And I think, you know, this has actually helped me interpret a lot of the things I've, I've learned in the sort of recent salons that we've had uh, and in recent papers that I've read. And so hopefully you'll find this useful as well. 
All right. So if there's any questions, if anybody has any questions they want to ask, I'll stick around for a little bit to answer them. Uh, if not, we are a little bit over our time. Uh, and so I'll, I'll just end it. Charlotte, uh, Charlotte, that was a great talk. I have one comment, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious about, there's probably an analog here between like uh, neural networks that are explicitly designed to be compositional or modular. So I'm thinking of kind of modular uh, neural network architectures that, for example, Jacob Andreas has worked on where you explicitly have different uh, neural modules, which you can piece together in various ways. And the output of one neural module, for example, is like some sort of embedding that's useful for identifying the color of an object in an image some sort of embedding that's useful for identifying the count, the number of objects in an image, right? Uh, and so there probably are some tie-ins between the kinds of explicit types you've mentioned here and these neural network architectures that specialize for producing certain outputs of specific types. Yeah, yeah, that's actually a good point. I think one thing that um, is suggested by this is that maybe actually you want those intermediate types to also be, say, useful for linearly predicting features, like you mentioned, the color of an image or something like that. Or like it could also aid with like problems of explainability and interpretability. If you have sub-modules of the network that are explicitly dedicated by means of like, they must produce an embedding that's useful for a particular task to say shape inference or texture inference or um, like, being useful downstream for segmentation or not being useful for segmentation. You could also explicitly say, do not be useful for this particular downstream uh, task. I think, yeah, you could, Im you could enrich these intermediate embeddings that the neural networks are producing uh, and make them, um, uh, yeah, make them, make, make them more powerful, make them more useful um, and make them more modular. So uh, it's, I think it's, I think it's an idea. A lot of people are kind of, you know, circling around and I'm excited to see where it, where it goes. Um, yeah, Jack Wimbish in the YouTube chat says, great analogy with the additive Roman numeral type really helps explain the intuition. So no, uh, uh, no notes there, no, no questions, but, but, a, uh, um, but some appreciation. So thanks, thanks Jack. Um, I hope you, you should definitely check out that blog post that I linked there, Sandy Metz's blog post. It's really uh, a really interesting sort of thought about like, okay, what can we learn from this, um, from this example? All right. Well, uh, yeah, Jesse, thanks so much for coming on the on the salon and presenting your research. I'm, uh, I, as I said, I'll be I'll be watching closely to see your future work. Uh, and thanks to everybody for coming. Take care, all.